Good morning to everyone. Let me welcome everyone and at the same time say thank you for joining us this morning on this morning's webinar, Projects and Interventions in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Part 1. My name is Wendy Michael and I am the representative for the Food and Nutrition Fan Project in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. My responsibility is with the project in St. Vincent includes ensuring that activities of the project are implemented. That may include liaising with different ministries, institutions on behalf of the project, following up on ethics approval for studies and organizing activities to be conducted in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. St. Vincent and the Grenadines have benefited from the Food and Nutrition Project through research work undertaken by fan project researchers and presented to you in the form of webinars. We have had webinars in the past on dietary patterns in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, trends, drivers, and impact, and on school nutrition in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that was based on research work by the project. We also had a grocery wrap competition where the main winner in the competition was treated to a shopping spree with a nutritionist. This was in an effort to highlight healthy food choices for the family. The Women's Farmers Academy being undertaken under the project through collaboration with Helen Daughters out of St. Lucia, where several Vincentian women are receiving training on different aspects of agriculture. There is also the Small Grants Program that is being coordinated by Dr. Natalie Tony at the Ministry of Agriculture. I would like to invite you to join the online Facebook group, Fan Project SVG Team Webinar Group, where you can find postings of previous webinars. I also want to urge you to listen to what is going to be presented today and see how the findings in the presentation can assist you in guiding your program and other activities. Now, just to give an overview of the purpose of the webinars. In 2018, the International Development Research Center, IDRC, funded the dietary, the food and nutrition project with the overarching goal of improving dietary patterns and dietary diversity among CARICOM population to reduce the burden of diet-related non-communicable diseases in the region. The project is led by the University of the West Indies and undertaken in three CARICOM countries, namely Jamaica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Kitts Nevis. The FAN Project Country Team Update and Revitalization Webinars Series plans to strengthen coordination between the FAN Project, its St. Vincent and the Grenadines team, and project work in country in order to enhance the sustainability of country interventions. Now, I would like to say the ground rules for today's webinar. Your microphone is muted. So to speak during discussion sessions, click the raise hand icon at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the screen. Click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen if you prefer to type any question you have. No use of inappropriate or offensive language. I will now like to invite Catherine to take over to discuss a short poll that would be undertaken with you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on our uh, third webinar with St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I have a poll that should have come up on your screen when you logged on. And almost all of you, we have two of you left to uh, answer the two questions. So if you haven't already, I'll give you about 30 seconds. Uh, there's just two questions. What sector do you work in? And what are you hoping to get out of today's session? So if you can, I'll give a couple seconds for anyone who hasn't to fill those out. And then I will end the poll and discuss the results very briefly. Okay, so you should see on your screen what the results are. So most of you are from the government sector, almost half. 
and about a, a third are from the private sector. Um, we have 6% from civil society, 3% from the media. Thank you for joining us. This is the first time we've invited media and 24% um, from other. Um, curious to know who you guys are, so feel free to share in the chat. And in terms of what you're hoping to get out of today's session, uh, it looks like the majority of you want to improve your knowledge and issues related to food security and nutrition in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, so that's great because that's what we really want to do here. And you want to learn a bit more about the Food Nutrition Project. Network and engaging and civic duties came a little bit um, lower on the list. So thank you for sharing this information with us. It paints a little picture of, of who we have with us. I'm going to stop sharing and hand back over to Wendy. Okay, just to note that um, Katrin Brown is a part of the technical team who will be controlling the slides. There's also Ashley Foster Eswick and Alana White who will track persons with raised hands and unmute them to speak during discussion segments and read aloud some questions, comments from the Q&A. Now there will be two 10, 10 to 15 minutes presentations with brief questions, comments after each. However, there will be opportunity for a more lengthy discussion after both presentations. I would now like to introduce the speakers who are researchers of the FAN project. Ms. Caitlin Carew is an advocate and change maker in the field of gender equity in agriculture and rural development. She is the founder of Helen's Daughters, a nonprofit organization that focuses on rural women economic empowerment through advocacy, capacity development, and improved market access. Professor Fitzroy Henry has served 18 years as a director of the Caribbean Food and Nutrition Institute, a specialized center of the Pan American Health Organization, and he is a professor of public health nutrition in the College of Health Sciences and the School of Public Health and Health Technology, University of Technology, Jamaica. I will now like to welcome Ms. Carew to begin her presentation. Good morning, everyone. And again, thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor. Um, basically, what I'm going to do today is to provide a snapshot of the Women's Farmers Academy, um, which took place in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I would honestly say that um, the Women's Farmers Academy has essentially been a labor of love between Helen's Daughters and also the FAN project. Um, just to give you a bit of background on Helen's Daughters, we started out in 2016 as an organization that really focuses on the economic empowerment of rural women. And that was in several ways, um, teaching them the use of more adaptive, um, innovative agricultural techniques that cost less. Um, capacity building, which you'll hear more about from the aspect of the Women's Farmers Academy, and also improved market access. As I said, um, this WFA, as we call it, the Women's Farmers Academy, um, really started almost two years ago from July 2020, when myself and um, Professor Lafia Samuels were both panelists um, at a food a mission Food Possible panel that focused on mobilizing change at a grassroots level to improve food security. And um, we really had a shared interest, I would say she was focused on the nutrition side, uh, myself on the entrepreneurship and market access side for women. And um, we realized that um, it would be more powerful for the two organizations to connect. Um, Helen's Daughters has been deploying several training programs, um, which we call the Rural Women's Ag Academy in St. Lucia. And we definitely wanted the opportunity to spread these free training programs um, to as many women in the region as possible. Uh, so we retrofitted what was called the Rural Women's Ag Academy 
and we created the Women's Farmers Academy, uh, which we deployed since last year in St. Kitts and Nevis and also St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, now, several of you persons may ask, okay, why women farmers? And then where does the nutrition aspect come in? And what we have noticed is that women have been innovators in the food sector. They dominate ag um, sectors such as agro-processing, and they have also dominated sectors such as conservation and intercropping. Um, while several, um, we would say that men and women even farm in a different way. And women, if you ask, even in our surveys and so on, many women, the first thing that they say is that, um, yes, I'm growing something, but I'm really interested in knowing the nutritional value and the effects that it has on my family. Um, and we, as we usually say, when you invest in a woman, you invest in a family. And, and the same goes for women in agriculture. Um, in our surveys, it shows that women had a keen interest in understanding the nutritional value, um, understanding the more sustainable agricultural practices um, utilized. We saw that a number of women were interested more in organic production, even though it was small scale, but rather instead of focusing on the quantity, but the quality of the produce. Um, and essentially, again, we align quite well with um, food um, the FAN project, and we came up with the WFA. One, to focus on re-empowering, I would say, marginalized groups. Now, I don't like to use the word marginalized because um, I think in this presentation, you probably see and understand that these women were quite resilient, especially in St. Vincent, and given the circumstances with the pandemic and then the eruption, um, but also we wanted to really remove barriers for women to access agricultural training. Um, as you know, when you put on a gender lens, which you don't find often in the agricultural sector, our intervention was designed so that it could be accessible to nursing mothers, to persons who had, women who had full-time jobs, um, were managing a farm, but only had maybe two hours on evenings, um, made it as accessible and as flexible to our women to spread that knowledge and um, throughout. And also finally, to create what I've noticed, a sisterhood in agriculture. Um, you can go so far alone, but in, in when you have strength in numbers, you can go as far as possible. And we've started seeing that in the peer-to-peer -peer engagement, which I will talk about later on with our WhatsApp groups and our Facebook groups, that um, aside from just learning from our mentors and facilitators, but they are literally learning from one another as well. And that was really the type of um, supportive ecosystem that we wanted to create with the WFA. And obviously in creating a supportive ecosystem, um, it's not just us at Helen's Daughters and our um, friends at FAN, but we really had some amazing, I'd like to say, facilitators. Um, we had an all-women team for SVG, and that was quite exciting. Um, and you can see their, their portraits here. We had, we try our best really to not just choose persons that have the substance, but also persons that are literally invested in the sector, that are working in the sector, that have worked with women and rural communities. And also they have that passion and that need to want to see our women grow um, in the sector. And for example, we have Miss Mishka Edwards, who is a lecturer um, in St. Vincent, and also she's an agricultural entrepreneur as well, as, have, as well as having a background in working in the Ministry of Agriculture. We have Ms. Nisha Glasgow, who led agribusiness and market linkages, another amazing agri-entrepreneur. She is also, um, I believe, an advisor at the Center for Enterprise Development Unit in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have Ms. Theo Morrill, who was our food safety expert, and she was a former VP for Kraft and Kellogg's for decades. Um, we have Ms. Valerie Telly Onu, our financial literacy guru. Um, who really has been paving the way in fintech in our region. And finally, we have Miss Sam Alex, a new and very welcome addition who, who you'll be hearing about very soon, um, who took us into nutritional marketing. Sam has a, a very, well, I would say, thriving um, health and wellness store that's doing quite well here in St. Lucia. And I think um, she was just perfect for the nutritional aspect um, that we newly revolutionized in this in cohort two. 
um, if you will notice, as I mentioned, it's not just about, again, subject matter experts, but we wanted persons that were actually in country. Um, so what we had was that 60% of our facilitators we found in country. Every single person, though, came from the Caribbean basin. And as I mentioned before, they have the experience working with women, working in rural and agricultural communities, and actually working specifically in the sectors. Because the idea is that the, we want to create partnerships and linkages, even from a facilitator aspect. So if there's any handholding, um, for example, if um, in creating a food safety plan, or if someone is interested in fintech, for example, they know of someone, there's, there's literally someone that can pass them in the street that they can fall on. Um, we took a train the trainers program and we've taken that approach from inception really um because there's several things that we take into consideration one helen's daughters is not um an all-seeing organization um we were entering into new territories and we wanted to understand the perspectives of one our beneficiaries and two also our facilitators who have had the, this previous experience so co-creation was quite key um, in taking into account how we created our module. If you notice and you've been following, what you see in um, the first cohort, you it's it's um, we have tweaked it for this cohort, and I will speak with um, speak about that. And also for this third cohort that's going to start up in June, there will be some changes as well. Um, and then finally, going over our, our topics. Um, we went through a series of topics from market linkages and agribusiness, um, sustainable agriculture, food safety, financial literacy, and nutritional marketing. Um, so this was eight weeks, eight very heavy weeks, um, two, sometimes three hours a night. Um, but the women, I'm telling you, they were engaged um, because we graduated about 51 women a few weeks ago. Um, and they all uh, literally, I think, attended 80% of classes to be able to graduate. Um, and what you will notice is that when we did our bas the baseline surveys, we noticed that there is a very thriving agricultural background in St. Vincent in comparison to perhaps in Kitts and Nevis. So in St. Kitts and Nevis, we started with sustainable agriculture because we thought that um, that expertise was needed there. But with St. Vincent, we noticed that um, we needed to start with market linkages and agribusiness because our beneficiaries were at the point they were already in the sector and what they wanted to do was take their businesses further, with, whether it was marketing, customer service or market linkages and so on. Funnily enough, in the surveys, and I guess thankfully enough, um, some of the comments were that uh, the program was too short. Um, and there's only so much that we can kind of squeeze in into eight weeks, um, but this was really a snapshot of um, what we included. And, and really, I just wanted to kind of quickly go over some of the things that we kind of touched on. For example, in market linkages and agribusiness, we really covered the four pieces of marketing from product, price, place, promotion, um, building up and understanding agribusiness systems, and really kind of creating that mindset. Because what we found in agriculture in our region is that we are training our producers simply as producers, but there's the expectation that they're also supposed to be producers and also entrepreneurs. So that entrepreneurial mindset has not been crafted a lot in our region. And we're really trying to create that mindset in them that no, you're actually an agricultural entrepreneur, even if it's a backyard garden. Um, but whatever surplus you're selling, whatever, that is a business that can change your family. Um, for sustainable agriculture, we specifically spoke on some key areas. One of them was climate change. The other was soil health. Um, I think that our farmers do not understand the, the importance of soil and its health. And obviously in the region, we know of what we have gone through with soil erosion, the high use of pesticides as well, everything, every little thing starts with the soil and that was quite important for us. Also, want water conservation and management was a big thing for us as well. And finally, post-harvest management. Um, spoilage is a huge issue in the Caribbean. And what we're trying to do is literally um, allow our farmers to understand, okay, how you can, aside from just um, raw production, but how can you store and save and extend the shelf life of some of the produce that you're using? Um, 
And also, I just wanted to give you a background on our WFA participants. Um, again, when we started this program and this project, we were just kind of going into two new territories and wondering, oh, maybe persons might not be that interested. We don't know, it's a testing. So when we sent out the call for applications, thinking that we would only train 40 in most countries, 40 women, 359 women applied. And immediately we saw, okay, there's a need for this type of training in our region and we need to really up the ante. Um, and one of the key things that I just really loved and, and appreciated throughout our surveys and our research was that generally farming is characterized by an aging population. Um, in some areas, it's above the age of 45. In some areas, even in St. Lucia, for example, it's 55 to 65 years. Um, that's the average age of a farmer. But what we saw in our part participants was that 25%, a quarter of the participants were between the ages of 18 to 29, and 35% were between the ages of 30 to 39. So 60%, more than half of the group, were much younger than the Caribbean average. Um, and that really is telling, and I think it, it, it makes me hopeful for the future of agriculture as well. Um, again, when we look at those that actually did own their farms and so on, another inspiring and hopeful um, trend that came out of that was 91% said that at least one family would continue to farm the land as part of the next generation. In terms of agricultural marketing and their pro um, products, 50% of the participants sold their produce to others. 87% were actively promoting the sale of products, whether it's on social media, other um, communications channels, such as WhatsApp, whether some had even gone as far as having a website and so on. Um, of those participating in the program, over half said that they would benefit from support in marketing their products better. And finally, when it came to overall support, particularly government support, we noticed that 81% of our participants said they had received no support from government. 72% had never received any formal training to support their farming. 59% said they were not registered as farmers with the Ministry of Agriculture. And 78% weren't currently part of any agricultural or farming groups to gain support. Um, and I just want to kind of put in here a call out because um, I noticed there's a lot of ministry officials and, and while I will mention this, but um, we're really trying to have Helen's daughters stay in SBG um, and stay to support women in agriculture. Um, and in this case, um, such as St. Lucia, what we noticed is that um, we're trying to really up the ante with regards to women actually infiltrating the formal sectors of agriculture because women typically tend to be in the informal sector. And that really starts out with whether they are actually registered as farmers. In St. Lucia, we lobby government and partnered with them. And our program, our Rural Women's Academies, was actually used as a substitute for the global, um, the Good Agricultural Practices Program. So that after taking that and obviously getting through um, the other verifications, women were actually able to access and get their um, registration cards. And we're hoping, calling on any of the ministry officials in SVG that perhaps we can try to do the same and partner up to see how we can try to really infiltrate and make women be a part of the formal sector as much as possible. Um, this uh, really is a background in terms of the parishes um, that they came from, again, to give you an idea of the um, age ranges and so on. And I think what was really, really touching and beautiful about this was one, we started this program in the midst of a pandemic. Two, um, we continued this program just after um, the effects of an eruption. And you know what was I think quite telling was that when we looked at um, parishes such as St. Patrick, Charlotte, St. David, who were affected by the eruption, you notice that there's 35% of participants that probably were affected and they um, carried on, they continued on. And um, I really have to say the resilience in the SVG group has shown quite clearly. And, and it really has been an honor and a pleasure to be a part of that journey with these women. Um, you'll have Ms. Janil King on to give a bit more information, but SVG has really been, um, uh, it has been a group to remember, that's for sure. In terms of challenges and successes, as I've mentioned, um, 
working in a pandemic and then obviously the after effects of our eruption we dealt with a lot even you know the quandary things like wi-fi challenges and so on but we try to overcome that um, with the creation of our whatsapp groups which we will continue um, our facebook um, groups as well so that they could access videos um, presentations and other materials online um, whether it was them getting into groups you'll hear from miss kim king about their recently launched recap buddy system as well um, but svg had 80 percent attendance rates and that's in both cohorts and so far we've trained about 70 women and that's graduated so those are women that have actually gone through completing 80% of their classes and their coursework. And um, with this new cohort, we're really aiming to see if we can try to touch an additional 50 to 60, maybe even 70 women um, so that we can really try to train, train as much as possible. Um, we obviously use a blended approach. So um, as I mentioned before, the Facebook groups and so on, we are in the process, and I know Fan is as well with the legacy website of uploading and creating a digital resource library so that um, even persons that didn't take the program, they can have access um, to these videos and some of these demonstrations. Um, one of the key things that came out and it started in St. Kitts and Nevis was to have a farm visit. Um, one of our facilities has actually opened up his farm and had obviously a practical demonstration visit. And we saw that that, would ha that had to be mandatory. So it's something that's actually, even though the courses have stopped, we're going to so in the next two to three weeks, start with SVG with regards to farm visits. And we're actually having one happen this coming Saturday in SKN in St. Kitts and Nevis um, as a mandatory component because there's only so much that we can talk about and share about virtually but obviously agriculture it has a very big practical component to it and also it's again that peer-to-peer -peer, that mentorship that sisterhood we're trying to really bolster that up as well particularly when we notice that a lot of women have not really had experience in agricultural groups and so on um I mentioned our SVG WhatsApp group, which really is a buzz. Um, it really is a peer-to-peer -peer training resource, I would say. Um, they're not only learning from their facilitators, but from one another. Um, and as I said, we're not going to close this out because we've noticed that it's fostering a lot of ideas, advice, and even partnerships. The future. The future seems bright um, with SVG, as I said, and with SKN, we are going to continue. We are launching another WFA, Women's Farmers Academy, in June, um, and we are going to continue next year and every year thereafter, and it's going to be completely free because agricultural education and knowledge needs to be completely free. Um, we are in the process of creating and establishing a cluster in SVG, and we have already made allocations um, for one of our facilitators, Ms. Mich Ms. Michka Edwards, to hold a board position in our central executive, so which oversees governance for all three countries, so that we can really create a robust programming for SVG in the year to come. Um, so that was our snapshot. Very, I tried to be brief as possible. Snapshot of the Women's Farmers Academy in SVG. I really want to thank. I see some of the women and the participants that have been there. I really want to thank them again for trusting us in taking them through this journey. And now I really want to give the floor to Ms. Sam Alex, who is our actual nutritional and marketing um, guru, and then also Ms. Janiel King, who really has been a bubbly and amazing um, WFA graduate and former participant. So thank you, everyone. Good morning again, everyone. I tested my mic previously, so I know everybody could hear me. Thank you so much for um, having me. It is really, um, it's really wonderful to be here today. When, um, you know, I saw that this activity was going to happen, I was really interested in being a part of it, and I'm thankful. I'm actually happy to be a part of the Women's Farmers um, <clears throat> Academy training, which was interesting for me, and not just interesting, but it's something that I've been passionate about for, you know, a number of years. And it was really wonderful working with the ladies. The ladies were um, very much interested in learning 
they were on point, on time, um, participating, and definitely you can see that they are passionate about what they do, and they were eager to acquire the knowledge and to gain the enlightenment to assist them with um, marketing their products you know, on a different level. Um, we, for nutritional marketing, we pretty much looked at the importance of educating our customers on the nutritional value of the foods that we sell, whether it is um, produce, you know, whether you're going to be enlightening your customers about the nutritional value of rosemary or plantain or your organic chicken or your duck eggs or, you know, a simple culinary herb or um, for some persons in the case of, um, of products, you know, because there is agro processing as well taking place within the group. And so the ladies are making cakes, they're making flowers, they're making um, cereals, they're making pies and different dishes. So, you know, it is important that persons understand the nutrients or the nutritional value of what they're consuming, because we live in a world now um, where non-communicable diseases are increasing, are on the increase in the region and in the world. So it is very important that we learn how to use food as medicine. Persons now are more interested than they have ever been in macros and protein and green food movements, organic food, sustainable agriculture. We see an increase in the plant-based diets. A lot of persons are going vegan. We also see that persons are interested in keeping their health in check by eating the right foods. Um, persons who are diabetic, persons who have high blood pressure, or just you know everyday individuals who want to ensure that they are eating healthy. Tomorrow is World Health Day, and you know this event is very timely because indeed a healthy nation is a strong nation. So as food manufacturers, food processors, we are really missing the mark if we leave out nutrition. Nutrition is important. An individual may be looking at a herb or a product and not quite aware, hmm, should I buy this? Should I, should I buy this rosemary? Should I buy this thyme? Um, and when they're educated on the benefits of that particular food product, they are mind blown. And they're thinking, oh my God, I never knew this all along. I have been consuming thyme, you know, thyme from a child. So I have always had basil, um, but I didn't know that it can do this. I didn't know that it's good for my digestive system or, you know, it's good for my immune system. So nutritional marketing is very important. What we did in the course is that um, we went through effective nutritional marketing strategies and those strategies were highlighted in a very detailed and simple manner so the participants could understand. We looked at blogging, we looked at social media marketing, we looked at website creation, we looked at influencer marketing, and of course, labeling, which is an extremely important and sometimes overlooked component of nutritional marketing. Because we think Facebook, we think Instagram, we think YouTube, we think print media, radio, television, but we don't think, what about the label? the label needs to also reflect what's in the product. So we, we looked at making health claims, nutritional health claims, general health claims, and how the label should highlight what persons are looking for. If they want less sugar, the label should say reduce sugar. Or if they want you know, zero fat, the label should say fat free. If the item or the food um, product has fiber, it should say a source of fiber. So we looked at those strategies and we also looked at the nutritional marketing mediums, um, you know, like the newspaper, the print media, the television, the different mediums that can be used to implement or to rather execute those strategies. And we also looked at um, making the food, the health food connection, because food is meant to nourish the body. And so you cannot look at food, you cannot discuss food, you cannot grow food and sell food if you don't also look at the nutritional benefits of that food. So the two go hand in hand. And of course, we also looked at our unique selling proposition in the sense that many persons into farming businesses may have similar business ideas, but it is important to differentiate your business so that it stands out. There must be something that makes it distinctive as it relates to your competitor. So we looked at the nutritional, sorry, the um, unique selling proposition and how we can make those assertive claims to position our business and to promote those businesses. We also um, 
did an, ass an assignment, which actually was executed excellently by the team, by the participants. Um, and this, as this assignment was pretty much doing a nutritional marketing pitch. And so they were split into groups where they had to execute um, some type of marketing pitch for a product of their choice. And so we saw persons executing for juices, cold pressed juices. We saw um, herbs like rosemary. We saw there was one that stood out in my mind, quacked with confidence, which was about, um, you know, duck farming, duck eggs. And this participant was able to demonstrate how duck eggs were superior nutritionally um, to chicken eggs and as well give you better value for money because it's bigger and so it yields more. So these, assi these assignments were executed really well and it really demonstrated that the participants understood the material. They knew how to implement and apply it. And one of the beautiful things that happened after the sessions, a participant reached out to me and said, okay, I have my herb tea business and I'm now doing my labels and I would like some guidance. I would like some assistance on how to do it. And she said, you know, I didn't think about this before. I did not think about putting nutritional content on my label. But after this course, I now see that it is important. And so that was very heartwarming for me because it was clearly evident that the participants saw how this um, benefited them. And of course, not just nutritional marketing, but all of the courses that were presented um, really were life-changing for the participants. We heard them speak about it at the graduation and even at the sessions. The instructors really did an amazing job. Um, and they are definitely um, vested in seeing that the participants have successful farm businesses and do well. And we're still always available to help if they reach out to us via the groups or one-on-one. -on -one, we are more than willing to provide the guidance and support. For me, it was also a tremendous ex experience um, doing what I love as a health coach and um, owning a plant-based holistic health business. Um, which is like Kitlin says, a model for nutritional marketing, because I also have to promote my, my products and what we do, my services on the nutritional basis. So um, it was really amazing. And again, I am grateful for the opportunity to be here, um, honored and humbled. And I would like to continue to be involved in this movement and in Helen's Daughters um, for the long haul. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I hope. Good morning, everyone. I am Janiel King. I am one of the recent graduates from the SBG cohort. Um, the, the last eight weeks was amazing. It was amazing. And um, there's so much to say, but let me stay on track. Um, one thing I must say is that Helen's daughter advertisement that I saw on Facebook came into my life timely. Because for me, the reason I got involved is that I was diagnosed as a diabetic um, a few years ago. And within my diagnosis, I was learning that food can be medicine, but I recognized I needed a bit more information. I also recognized I needed a ton of money to maintain a healthy lifestyle as a diabetic to save my life. No, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have tons of fruits and vegetables. But for some of us, we may not be able to afford it. So one of the things I realized was to do farming. But again, I was lacking the required information to produce a proper farm. So when I saw the advertisement on Facebook that day, I was just looking at my failed cucumber bed <laughs> and my failed other things I was trying to farm. So I applied because it said that if you are interested in knowing how to do a farming business, um, to apply, I was one of, I, I met the criteria. I wanted to start a farming business, had no prior experience, had, no, I wouldn't say no, but barely any prior experiences. I needed information on launching the business, but not only on launching the business, you know, but on farming itself, like farming some of the things that I was already eating and other things, other information and other things I needed to eat. So I applied, but I think I got more than I bargained for. And that's a good thing. Helen's daughter, we, we, we were in class two days a week for two, two days a week for eight weeks. And it was intense, yes, because it was later on in the day. So if you had work to deal with, other things to deal with, so you had to still be alert for class. But the information was, wow. When I started, 
And when I started Helen's Dust, I had a business idea. Listen to me now, idea I had. Hello, I had an idea. But Helen's Dust not only helps you to take what is here and make it into a reality. So uh, we started in January, finished two weeks ago in March, right? At the time I started, my business idea was not registered. It's registered now. I have a legally registered business right now. But uh, I, let me, let me correct myself. I have a legally registered agricultural business in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And that registration took place within the time frame of me being a part of Bowman Farmers Academy in SVG. Additional to that, right, I, I got tons of information, information that I knew I needed, but also information that I didn't know I needed. I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> so Helen's daughters, the, the facilitators, Sam, and the other facilitators, they were extremely good. One of the things I realized as well is that there are many persons who are experts in various things, but there's a difference between having the information and being able to share the information, right? And also sharing the information, utilizing emotional intelligence. Because within my cohort, the second cohort, I recognize their various um, academic skill sets within our group the various age groups. So as a facilitator, you had to meet everybody. You know, everybody needed to understand what you were saying. Everybody needed to be able to participate. And they also were able to not only explain it so that you could understand, but they also held your hand. They held your hand before class, during class, after class. We have graduated from WFA. But for example, tonight, um, we're doing something that's called, what, we're doing something that's called, that's called, I'm reading your messages, guys. We're doing something that's called Recap Buddies. Basically, because it's eight weeks, right? And, and, you know, on a given day, you might have showed up to class, you sat in class, but you may have missed something. So we have the recordings of the live lectures. We have the slides. So we're, 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 we have created a group where, where we are going to review what we have done. And tonight is the first session and it's on nutritional marketing with Sam who just spoke, she was the facilitator. And Sam again is going to be in that session. That's going to be a 40 minute session where, where those of us who have reviewed the slides and the, and the recording of this session, and we may have not understood something but we didn't have time in class to say we don't understand it. Tonight at Recap, Recap Buddies, we're gonna discuss it amongst ourselves as classmates and then Sam, the facilitator, is also going to be there as a part of a informal discussion. So that's support. So one of the things I, one of the other things I got, I did not, I did not only get um, access to information to help me put my idea that's here into reality and take it off of paper, I was able to help to mold that, I was able to get help to mold that idea I was able to get support during putting the idea together, support no after I'm putting the idea together. I was able to meet other women farmers in St. Vincent. Now for me, I'm, I was not a woman farmer. I was somebody who had an idea, no farming experience, just an idea. And I recognized the importance of the agricultural industry. So though I didn't want to put my hand in that, I learned and I'm still learning, right? It's still a journey for me. No, the networking supports we have. No, I was on the fence. When I saw on the fence, I was one of the persons who had an idea. So I wasn't a farmer, right? I wanted to get involved in the agricultural industry and I wanted guidance that way, right? So I joined and I met persons who were already farmers who are in the business, who have who have businesses for years, women farmers, and they needed other types of assistance. So they were able to share their own experience as business owners for years in different things, agri-processing, poultry, crops, different things. And there are persons who are new startup persons who are able to share their experience. And there are persons like me who had an idea and wanted to get involved. So there were three spectrums that you were able to learn from. Then when you're in the course for the eight weeks, and even now that we've, we've graduated. So we make it, I've, made, I've made friends with persons from the first cohort of WFA SVG. I have friends from my cohort, and obviously when they start the third cohort, you want to still have friends, business partners, new business partners. Using myself as an example, um, when I started, I needed help with one thing. When I graduated, I not only got help with that one thing, but I also have now partnered with somebody else to start something else that, I, that was never in my thought processes. When I started, so, so to me, as a graduate that just graduated in March 2022, I'm excited. Um, I'm still, I'm still, you can see in the setting up space, but 
the networking that we still have ongoing, the, the availability of the facilitators um, who Helen's daughter brought in, and also Keith Ling, Linnell. We have such great assistance. And again, I cannot leave here with, 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 without happening on the emotional intelligence. They, they have hit that on to see how much it's not hit it's a real hard in terms of we are getting support that fees like top dollar that we've paid for and we did not pay any money it was totally free the professionalism the information the networking and at times the hand holding you know so as a graduate of of woman farmers academy and svg i am humbled i'm grateful i am thankful and oh and caitlin said something a while ago she said uh, what they did in st lucia i think she said i think it's not sure which one she said but, but she mentioned about the partner with the government to help help women farmers get ids now as somebody who just getting into the industry i was listening to a lot of the existing um women farmers in my cohort these are persons who are contributing to our industry in St. Vincent. They're farming for years. Some of them have businesses registered, but they don't have farmers' IDs for some of these because of some of the requirements <laughs> to get a farmer's ID. But they're already in the industry. So, and, and as they're talking and, and they're sharing some of their limitations, I'm saying, yeah, when I went by the ministry, you was told that too. But I didn't realize that you could have the same challenge as me and you're already in the industry. You're already producing, and in some cases, producing on a large scale. So Keith and I think that's a really great idea. Um, but on behalf of myself, on behalf of the other graduates from my cohorts, I am extremely thankful. I'm excited. I am just, yeah. So that's my take as a graduate. And I'm, I'm yeah, I'm just excited, yo. Thankful. So I'm finished. Thank you very much, Janelle, Ms. Carew, and Ms. Alex, for your very informative and interesting presentations. We, now, we will now like to welcome you to provide questions and comments by using the raise hand icon or typing in the Q&A box. We will unmute you as you raise your hand. We have one question from Ms. Lystra Fletcher Paul, who is asking, did you experience any barriers? If so, what were they? I think I will let, I guess, uh, Janiel speak about any barriers she may have encountered. And then, um, you know, Sam and Keith Lynn can go afterwards. Okay, as it relates to barriers, I think um, it was really self really because of the timing. After a long day, having to um, be in the, um, the class in the evening, the time we had to push through. And some days, you know, you may not have um, gotten all the information in a particular session because of what happened in your particular, then you're, you're extremely exhausted. But outside of that and technological issues like in some person's cases, current went, you know, or the internet dropped, those sort of things. Um, and um, also, for example, you may have, uh, after you have the classes ended, you may have had a question or whatever that you wanted to say in class. So, you know, the only thing is you, 
thankfully we had the support. So that, I should say that's a barrier because we could have still gotten the question answered. So that wasn't a barrier. But technological issues and the timing outside of that, um, or oh, um, we in some cases depending on the discussion and depending on what we had to cover, you wish you had more time right because in our cohort we had about 50 i think or 60 students so depending on the topic we were discussing and if persons had uh, challenges they wanted to share live because there was so much person so much persons at a particular time and the time it was so short you may not have not you may not have gotten the opportunity live that is to say what you wanted because of, because they wanted to, to they wanted to give us a lot of information and give it to us so well but the timing was not enough at time so timing lent we, if we had more time yes and i think I, I hope i'm not forgetting anything but for right now that was comes to my mind i will also add to, um, to janelle i think one of us on the back end with regards to challenges was obviously um the wi-fi issues at times so that was when really we had to really be in constant communication and ask persons um let us know if you're having wi-fi issues because obviously we we're taking attendance and then where that's where the whatsapp and the um facebook group came in where we could actually share later on with persons if um for example they missed out on anything and so on and i think the netbook of women also kind of kept others up to date as well so we try to bypass that as much as possible but again um in this pandemic era it, that was one of our i think um biggest difficulties okay i would like to i, I kind of think of them as challenges like kitlin said and not really barriers because they certainly were not obstacles. You know, with online learning, you have your fair share. There, are, There's, you know, backing dogs, there's child disturbances, there's Wi-Fi, technological issues, um, glitches, electrical glitches. It's, it's a long day, persons have worked for the entire day and it's in the evening, persons are exhausted, you know, neighborhood noises. Um, Cause you know, we're moms, we have families, we have businesses, we work. These were the challenges, but I'll tell you something, the entire group, lecturers, admin, um, Linnell, Kathleen, facilitators, the participants were all adaptable. They were all resilient. They were all focused and they were all willing. So I would say that these challenges were not deterrences. They were not hindrances in any form or fashion. And they were all, um, they were overcome. And despite everything, we persisted and we, and we accomplished. So that, that, is, that is my take on the challenges. Okay, there is a comment in the, in the Q&A from Shalisa. She said, as a farmer, I'm worried about the lack of income support that we are not receiving in SVG. I don't know if anyone had any comments on that or any other Can thing I say to something? add. Sure. Um, Janiel speaking here. Um, I, I've heard numerous persons mention the lack of support and I'm on the fence on that. So, and, and again, let me first say I'm on the fence and I'm new to this whole industry, but um. I recognize too, one of the challenges is exposure to information depending on your circle. Um, I, um, since I've been exposed to so many different persons within the agricultural industry, I'm recognizing there are lots of availabilities and grants. And also I'm recognizing the need for persons to know how to apply for a grant, right? And um, within your particular industry. So I have seen a bunch of stuff to apply for that I qualify for and I'm just, I'm just new to this whole thing. And I'm recognizing whilst being new, I need to learn how to apply for those grants. But at the same time though, I recognize I'm not the only person that needs to know how to apply for the grant. Persons who are in the industry themselves are facing some of the same challenges. So, um, and I'm only exposed to those information because I've been asking questions because I'm curious. So I've been getting information on different organization and different things that I can apply for. So sometimes the onus is on us as the person in it to 
um, seek the information for the grants, um, ask questions, and also be vulnerable. And I think I was blessed for the fact that um, when I have that emotional intelligence, it was for a reason. Many times persons are not comfortable stating that they want financial assistance because reality, the reality is, who, who comfortable begging for money? Nobody comfortable saying I need assistance. And when I come to you as an organization and I said to you, I need assistance with my business, you need to have the emotional intelligence to respond to me in a professional manner that don't make me feel a particular way. And what I realize as well, too, is again, not only emotional intelligence, but your network is key to access the information. So I, I'm not, I said, I, was, I, I said that I'm on the fence as about, as it relates to enough funding being there. I do not know enough to say there isn't, but from my experience thus far, based on me asking questions, seeking a network, I've been seeing many things I could apply for. And I'm presently in the process of getting my paperwork in order, um, finding a relevant person to apply for some grants. And even last month, I applied for a grant I wasn't even ready for just for the fun of it. Even though I was not ready, just to kind of get my mind wrapped around, how could I get applied for a grant? What's the process like? And I went through the entire process. I didn't think I was going to get it because, you know, whatever. But I did not get it. But my point is, it was there. I met all the requirements. And maybe there isn't enough. And I think, I think, that as I spend more time within the industry, that may be my end, that, that may be my stance. But for right now, I'm on the fence. And I think your network is key, is, is very key to getting you information on more funding information. Don't kill me, people. <laughs> we'll take Thanks, Janiel. Um, I see that Shandell Brown's hand is up. So we will let her go ahead and speak. Hello, good morning. My question is, um, how I just joined in this for the first time. Um, I like to know what you have to do to get into the Women Farmers Academy and the Helen's Daughters program. Thank you for that question. Um, so we will be, well, we do have actually persons that have already pre-registered for the Women's Farmers Academy. Um, there are a few slots available um, for persons who want to come on for the last cohort for 2022. And um, if you perhaps send in your name and email in the chat box, we can take it down so that as soon as the link goes live, we can send it directly to you. All you would need to do is um, basically complete two surveys and then you would be enrolled. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you for the questions. I would like to now move on to the presentation by Professor Henry. I would like to welcome Professor Henry to start his presentation. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Ms. Michael, um, for inviting me to present. Um, Kathleen, I thought I would be sharing my screen. Yeah, you're welcome to share I'm still seeing your screen up, no? Yeah, you just click, if you click share screen, you will take, take it will overtake it, okay. It's not doing it. You can try again now. If it doesn't work, I will share uh, my presentation slides for you. Okay, good morning. Um, 
good morning, all colleagues, uh, friends, collaborators. Um, let me say that after that first session, you uh, have to take a deep breath and you have to pause because you cannot but be impressed with the, the energy, with the passion, and uh, to me, most importantly, the untapped potential that we have in the Caribbean for agriculture and agricultural services that could exist. I listened to Keith Lynn um, in the presentation with St. Kitts and Nevis, and now here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And uh, you can't but wonder how many more on top potentials, how many more Genil Kings there are out there if it hadn't been for the fan project and the um, Helen's daughters, we probably wouldn't have heard about a Janil King um, and uh, a, a Sam Alex and uh, all the others. And uh, this makes me happy and it makes me also sad because it's, I'm sad because, you know, we, we're trudging along and not realizing what, what is out there that can be explored. Um, I, I, I'm taking part of my presentation to emphasize this because it's really, really critically important. We know governments are now moving towards service economies and agriculture is being squeezed more and more. And uh, with, you know, less than 2% being, um, you know, given to agriculture as, I don't know if it's a feel good effort or what. We see what potential is out there. And I'm glad that we have a lot of government officers in this um, webinar. I don't know how influential they are, but surely as Janil said, it's not just, well, just partnership to get an ID. Um, or Janil says it's her exposure to what is out there. It should be, in other words, I don't think that the authorities should be passive bystanders when we have this kind of potential that exists in our society. I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by, by, by the effort that, that is being put in. And I do hope that beyond the FAN project, in the interest of the whole Caribbean community, we can really move towards getting the untapped potential, I keep saying, because it is really so critically important, not only for agriculture, not only for entrepreneurship, but also for health, which is what I'm going to be dealing with. I take, I stand, uh, I, I, I take off by listening to Sam Alex when she says that we really need to um, improve and do our marketing. And she says that nutrition should not be left out. And I cannot agree with her more because that's the essence of my presentation today. So Keatlin, keep up the good work. Um, I hope Helen's daughters wouldn't be just Helen of the West in St. Lucia, but you can expend and expand it towards the other parts of the Caribbean region because we need more daughters all around. And I hope you all agree that the passion that was on earth in these just two other countries shows what potential there is. If there is um, legacies from this fan project, I think that this is one of them. And I hope it really moves from strength to strength. The topic of my presentation this morning is food imports and production. And uh, as I was alluding to, what are the implications for nutrition and health? And let me start by thanking my colleagues um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who worked with me, not on this presentation in particular, but on a series of other 
presentations and work that we have done, Wendy herself, um, Dr. Tony, Jethro Green, and uh, uh, my own colleagues here at the University, Bev Lawrence, who is on, online, Dr. Baliram, and several others that many of you have interacted with. Okay, the, you know, the project, the FAN project is looking at food security and public health. And this presentation is really looking more at the policy research and the policy aspects, the overview of what we need to do at a, a bigger or a global level, a framework level, so that the Helen's daughters can fit into that and make sure that we produce the kinds of food, as, um, as Sam said, that will be nourishing. So I start by looking at the definition of um, food security, and I'm doing this deliberately um, because it really is the trend um, and the thread of the presentation, it says when all people at all times have, phys have physical access to sufficient, sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets dietary needs and preferences for an active and healthy life. So food security is not just the physical presence of food. What I emphasize in red is that it must be related, as Sam said, to the nutritional aspects of what we do. If not, we are really taking one step forward and one step backwards because we might improve our food supplies, but we have to spend a lot of money with the consequences of not nutritious foods being available to us. Our Caribbean ministers of agriculture a few months after that summit in 1996, also emphasized that food security in the Caribbean is related to obesity, stroke, and heart attacks. Again, my emphasis. And it just emphasizes again why it is important for us to look um, to agriculture and health as twin partnerships in the move towards um, wellness in the in the Caribbean. So given that definition, you must ask yourself, is St. Vincent and the Grenadines food secure, given that definition? And when we look at the total food energy that is available in um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines over several decades, I think we might come to the conclusion that yes, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is certainly food secure because that gray line that you see across is the health goal, the population health goal. And we are producing now or having available to us much more food than we need for our health goal. But we need to dissect this overall pattern to see if in fact it is meeting food security as we define it. When we look at the consumption of staples in St. Vincent over that period, we see, okay, the amount of energy and uh, we look at the local production at the bottom and the imported ones at the top in the maroon um, color versus the blue color, which is local. We see that overall, yes, for staples, we have more than we need for the health goal. And when we look at legume consumption, most of it is from local production, very little imports, but we are way below where we should be in terms of our health goal, which is the green line up there. When we look at fruits, we see that goodness, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they are now consuming in the last decade or so, just about, um, what we need and a little bit more than what we need for fruits. And I think this is very good, particularly local consumption. So cheers and hats off to St. Vincent and the Grenadines for that. When we look at vegetables, however, when we look at a combined local and imported amounts, we see that we are way below in terms of vegetables. Fats and oils. This is where we are in terms of local production and imported, and we see imports now dominating the fats and oils in the latter decades, and we are more than double the amount of 
um, fats and oils consumed than what we need, which is the green line, our population health goal. When we look at food from animals, we see a similar pattern where in recent decades, we are consuming much more foods from animals than we need. And most of it is coming from external sources. We are importing them. And finally, when we look at sugars, we see a pattern where there is more than double the amount of um, sugar consumption than we need. And uh, a tremendous amount is coming from external sources, what we import. So we ask the question, is St. Vincent and the Grenadines food secure? And the first slide gives the impression that we are, but when we break it down by food groups, we see that we are not so secure if we stick to the definition of really producing um, an active and healthy lifestyle through our diet. Now these food imports, um, you look at St. Vincent and the Grenadine, Grenadines and you know, they import uh, just about uh, 80, 85 million US dollars in food um, every year. Um, compared with Jamaica that imports 954 million US dollars of food. But of course we have to look at it per person. So when we look at Jamaica, the imports are 326 US dollars per person. St. Vincent is $736 per person. So you see, when we break it down by population, we see that St. Vincent is much more. Barbados actually goes up to 996 US dollars per person per year. And uh, St. Kitts, um, is one million, sorry, 1,174 US dollars. And that really gives you an impression of how much imports there is per person. And uh, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, you may ask the question whether it is the tourist industry that is consuming a lot of these imports. As you know, um, that is a small amount because Jamaica, um, which has a lot of overstay tourists like Barbados, it's only about 6% of the imports that go towards the tourist industry. And in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I suspect that a lot of these tourists actually eat on board um, and what they consume. So it's, you know, even if it's not 736 and it's 700, it's still a lot of food imports per person. And then you ask the question, what are the imports? And you see that 13.5 million US dollars is from corn flakes, flour, rice, biscuits. Some of them are necessary and one would want to suppose or, or project that some of them can be substituted. Um, chicken wings and offals, 8.8 .8 million US dollars um, per year that is being spent on chicken wings and other food preparations, a motley collection of other things, um, 6 million um, cheese, milk, cream, including ice cream and all of that, $5.1 million. And sugary beverages and other juices, 3.7 million. Um, and I'm asking the question in my last slide, whether any of these or all of these or much of these can be substituted and what those replacements could be, ought to be. Um, and that's why, you know, when I listen to Helen's daughters and uh, the daughters that they have produced, we wonder how much input we can have in reducing this food import bill that we have by encouraging the untapped population to produce local, nutritious, healthy foods for our population. And I now want to, before I close, look at some of the processed imports, because as you know, almost, most of the food that we eat is processed, processed in some way. So there is the unprocessed, which is the fresh and minimally processed, which almost every, every food item we eat these days is has some amount of um, processing. And then we have basic to moderate um, processing. And then we have the ultra process. I put it in red because 
<clears throat> studies and the science has shown that is the ultra processed foods that are really detrimental to health. And we see that in St. Kitts and the St. Kitts, sorry, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are 17% of all of the imports, 17% um, in terms of dollars, 17% of all that we spend on imports are for these ultra processed health retarding foods. We can, and surely we can do better than that. And what are the main ultra processed foods? Sugar sweetened beverages, we have sweet biscuits, we have bread pastry, um, margarine and sugar confectionery ice cream. And then we have the swell cereals like corn flakes and the amount of money that we're spending on them. Sausages and uh, corned beef and this type of stuff, we also have um, lunch and meat. So, the summary is that St. Vincent and the Grenadines import bill was approximately 736 US dollars per person. The imports are dominant in the health retarding food groups like sugar, food from animals, fats and oils. But the imports are not major contributors to the health promoting foods like vegetables, legumes, and uh, fruits. I'm glad that the fruits are up there, but you see most of it was local, and that's good. The combined supply of fats and oils from imports and local sources, as you saw, was more than double the health goal. The sugar supply was more than two and a half times the health goal. A decline in local production over several decades must be of concern. Hopefully, um, with government intervention and other authorities coming in, we can contribute much more than the 2% that we're contributing to agriculture so that local food production can uh, find itself further up. That doesn't mean that we have to move away from service industry, which of course is very, very important, but we cannot ignore the agriculture part of and, and the recent pandemic showed us how important it, has, it is to have your local production up at a strong level because when push comes to shove and a pandemic is there, everybody is on its own and you have to, you're not going to depend on those imports because everybody looking after themselves. The pandemic was really instructive when it came to you know, the imports of the foods that we, we, we needed. So we have to have food sovereignty. The foods that are more than minimally processed was about 46% of all imports. And then the ultra processed foods, as I showed, was about 17% of the food import bill. So my final slide really asks the question, can St. Vincent and the Grenadines meet the CARICOM heads who met two months ago in Belize and they want to reduce the import bill overall in the Caribbean by 25% by the year 2025? Is it possible for St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a country to meet its own target of 25 by 25? Can the target be achieved and also improve public health? In other words, can we reduce that import bill, but focus more on if we, of course, we are net importers of food, but can we structure our imports so that we don't spend all the money back on diabetes and hypertension and um, these other chronic diseases that afflict us? And what are the local substitutes for these unnecessary imports? And what are the replacements for the dangerous ultra processed foods like the sausages and the delicious creams that we use and the margarines and so on? So, um, Wendy, I, I end there and I open myself 
and uh, for discussions and questions. Thank you very much, Professor Henry, for yet another interesting and informative presentation. I will now like to open the floor for questions and comments. Remember that you can use the raise hand icon or type in the Q&A section box. Apparently, everybody was asleep. Actually, there are several persons asking for copies of your presentation, um, Prof. <laughs> so everybody was quite awake. Okay, it's twenty-five US dollars per person, so I can go into my retirement feeling my pocket heavy. I'm joking, okay, the presentation will be free. <laughs> so I'll just jump in and say um, quickly that the, the webinar recording as well as the slides are going to be shared on the FAN project website in maybe six weeks or so. But if you do want to get this presentation earlier, I can definitely send it to you. So just pop your email address into the chat and we can take note of those. Thanks. Okay, I'm seeing a question from Annette Kerr and she's asking, what are some of the ultra processed foods? Um, all right, I can easily go back to this slide. Um, are you seeing the slide still? So um, jumping in, Fitz, right, your um, screen share didn't work, so I ended up sharing uh, my presentation screen for you. So okay, go to the one with main ultra-processed foods. Yes, just to summarize it, soft drinks, chips, chocolate, candy, ice cream, sweets and breakfast cereals, packaged soups, chicken nuggets, hot dogs, fries. These are all examples of ultra-processed foods. But yes, it's in the presentation too. I really love this presentation. I need a copy as well. For you, it's thirty dollars. <laughs> that means I get two copies. <laughs> no problem. Go. <laughs> okay. Okay, do we have any questions? I would like to ask, is any of the of this fan work result complementary to other projects that you're doing in your ministries in St. Vincent? Is there anyone from the ministries online who would like to answer? Is any of this fan work result complementary to other SVG projects or local policy objectives? Wendy, Jan Ile, can I say something? Sure. I saw um, a couple of days ago, Ministry of Agriculture, I think the department that I saw on Facebook was Rural Transformation, launched a home guard initiative in countryside. 
um, where they are giving seed links to various um, families or homes. I'm assuming that um, project is to help with the same food import bill. Um, when I started, I was really excited. I think what they're doing falls in line with what we're all trying to do in some way, but they're only catering to um, um, a particular cross-section for now. It seemed, it seemed like it's a new program that I saw. I was just monitoring their Facebook groups. I think in that kind of tie into the question that you were just asked from a Ministry of Agriculture point of view. Okay, thank you, Janiel. Um, Sam Alex has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. It's her her hand. Oh, sorry, her hand. <laughs> That's I okay. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to. It's not a question, but I just wanted to comment on um Professor Henry's um presentation. Um, I I mean I'm not from Saint Vincent. I'm not Vincentian. I am Saint Lucian. Um, but I do follow, you know, news in St. Vincent. I have friends in St. Vincent and that sort of thing. And um, basically what was presented was to me very eye-opening. And it is also, I believe, um, if I could say so, an indication of really what is happening um, across the region and not just St. Vincent, because we seem to be plagued by similar issues as it relates to high imports, the overconsumption of processed food, um, and of course, we suffer with the same health crisis, the same health challenges as a result. So I'm really thinking that such a presentation with that type of information would be excellent, um, very enlightening if it can be made or created for other islands with the same research to show what our consumption is like, what our import bill is like. It kind of really brings the point home to us that we need to do better and that we need to implement projects, but we also need to change our behavior because when it comes down to it, the individual consumer is um, going to the supermarket and purchasing these products. And so if we change from a consumer level and we practice different behavior, we buy more local, we buy um, less processed food, um, we would certainly see an improvement in the health of the population. I started in the beginning by saying a healthy nation is a strong nation. I mean, right here in St. Lucia, we have the number one, two, and three causes of death being completely preventable lifestyle diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary heart disease. And I would bet you it's probably similar statistics um, in the other islands. So I believe that some massive education campaign, in, even before government, um, government, you know, um, regulations because one may say okay let's just reduce imports let's import less let's let's do this let's do that but at the end of the day if the consumer is educated and enlightened and they're made to understand that most of those ultra processed foods are extracted from fats starches sugars you know hydrogenated fats and so on perhaps they would be more motivated to avoid purchasing those foods and focus on foods that build health. So I just I just wanted to make that interesting point, but this was very eye-opening. We need one of those for St. Lucia, St. Kitts, you know, Dominica, and we, we certainly need a regional um, educating campaign in that regard. But, Thank you, Sam. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. So sorry, but Sam, to add to what you, you just said, right? my challenge when I came home um, as a newly diagnosed diabetic i went to the market and i realized even the persons who are selling like the vendors and the farmers some of them are only selling the produce because okay let's say this is a, this is a random example eh? let's say um tom tomatoes are selling this week so they're just selling tomatoes because tomatoes are selling this week they're not selling say okay if you come if, if i go to them and i want guidance I'm a diabetic, what could I use to X, Y, and Z? I find a lot of information was not there from a health perspective. They're growing stuff, but they're not necessarily educated on the benefits of what they're growing so that they could actually educate us, the consumer, so we can buy more. So instead of you're, growing, instead of you're selling plantains or whatever because it's selling a lot, you know, getting other things that you could sell because the demand is there so we understand why we should buy it. And that information was not there. I even ran an experiment. I went in town for a week. And I spoke to as much vendors and farmers and asked them all the same information because I couldn't understand that I don't have the information that I need, but yet the persons them that I am hoping that could help me, they themselves too, there was a, a gap, they, they, there was a gap and they needed help too. So that is also important as well. And it's overlooked. 
Absolutely. And I agree with you, Janelle. That is why the work that Helen's Daughters is doing, educating the farmers, is very important. And we need to take it to a higher level. And of course, um, one of the things um, Kitlin mentioned when she was presenting is that there has been a gap for a long time in the sense that most of our farmers were older persons and a lot of the older generations are not as educated, they're not as savvy, and so they may not have the information. You are absolutely correct. I've encountered farmers who have told me straight off they don't even eat veggies, they just grow it to sell. So I, I do agree that the education is important and it can certainly, um, it can, you know, this whole Farmers Academy and the projects to come and the fan projects and what um, the professor was just speaking about can certainly ignite something at various levels to educate um, or anyone who is interested in learning. I, I do agree that it would be wonderful if the farmers knew that information and they can empower their consumer, the customer, but also for those farmers who may not have access, may not be literate, may not be interested, if we educate persons at a national level, they don't even need the farmer to tell them when they go to buy the produce, okay, you know, this has a low glycemic index. This is a, a, a simple carbohydrate. It's too starchy. Take the complex one instead. You know, your body's going to break it down slowly. It's better for diabetics. So if we have that massive education at that level, it's like public education campaigns everyone would have access to that information, including them, the, the consumer, the, the supplier, the producer, the farmer, those with the backyard gardens, everyone can have access to that um, powerful information. Okay, we have a number of hands raised, but before we get to those persons, Shandell Brown has a question about alternatives to ultra processed foods. So Professor Henry, would you like to answer this question? She wants to know what can be used instead of ultra processed foods. Um, so I know um, when, when, we think of, when we think of what the ultra processed foods are, I mean, <laughs> take ice cream, how many of us want to substitute ice cream and, uh, for fruits instead? Um, we, we have the alternatives there. It's a question of behavior. It's a question of culture. It depends on, you know, how many of us want, want to give up our sweet tooth. Um, so it's both a behavioral thing as well as a policy thing. But the alternatives are there. We know, I mean, when you look at your dietary guidelines that we spent a whole set of time developing in each one of the Caribbean countries in my previous job, um, we, we know exactly what they are. So there is no secret about what the alternatives are. That's not the challenge. The challenge is, you know, at a policy level, and that's what I was trying to bring out in this presentation. We have to look carefully at, you know, what is it that we import um, and uh, what is it we consume? So it's at the policy level and it's at the behavioral level. When we look at sausages and, um, you know, corned beef, how many of us want to give up sausages and corned beef? Um, these are standard breakfast things in some households. Um, are, are we willing to have guava, you know, pancake, guava juice and pancakes made from, you know, local flour and so on and so on? It's, it's, the, the alternatives are not difficult to find. It's whether or not we are willing to, to, to make, make that change. Um, so minimally processed foods, I think that, you know, we can organize our agriculture production system so that we can produce foods and we are doing that to some extent, not fast enough. Um, so those products are out there. They can be used, um, corn flakes. Do we, uh, how many of us want to get off corn flakes in the morning? Um, we might sit back here and say, oh, we don't need cornflakes, but are you going to convince everybody that, you know, cornflakes is not, you know, the thing to eat it, you know, with your sausages or your corned beef and then have your ice cream and all of your other stuff. So that's the challenge. We, you know, when we think of the Caribbean and the foods, the delicious foods that we have here, but because of tradition, because of culture, because of taste, and I dare say because of cost as well, um, we find ourselves glued to these ultra-processed foods that um, 
injure our health and then we complain about it, you know, in our statistics, you know, um, three out of five adults die from chronic disease. In Jamaica, almost four out of five die from chronic disease. Um, so, you know, it, it, we don't have to go too far to find the alternatives. Um, the challenge, as, as I try to portray, is, is you know, getting, getting the information out. Sam was asking if this information exists you know, in other countries. Um, it, it's very similar from country to country. Um, thanks to the FAN project, we were able to do it in St. Kitts and also St. Vincent. And thanks to FAO, we were able to do it in Barbados and also in Jamaica. And uh, the numbers are similar. You know, we need St. Um, Lucia, Lucia done, Professor. We have some information from a long, long time ago in St. Lucia. So we, we have some of that, but we can certainly update it. It's not in the past 10 years, but the pattern and the trend is similar. But more important than that, you know, Sam, when we send this presentation out to the participants here, okay, you look at it and you say, oh my goodness, we can do better and blah, blah, blah. Is that going to turn, is that going to move the needle? What we really need to do is to get in sessions like these, you know, the real decision makers who will be, you know, more conscious of what really needs to be done. I mean, I was asking earlier how uh, I saw a lot of government officials in, on, the, on, 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 on the call. Um, I don't know, as I said, I don't know what influence they have, but it would be good to have this presentation directly to them to show, and we can show the math. We can show that if you invest in things like, you know, Helen's Daughters, and if we invest in the kinds of local production for healthy foods, how much it can get, you, the return on investment is, is, is really, really great because diet is one of the most important um, contributors to obesity and NCDs. If we can turn around this, as other countries have shown, and parts of countries have shown, not entire countries, but in Scandinavia, they have done this spectacularly in a matter of five to 10 years. It's not going to happen overnight. But if we can start with this process, you know, how long it has been from the, the Port of Spain Declaration, 2007. We had a meeting a month after the Port of Spain Declaration in Jamaica called the St. Anne Declaration, where we had the ministers of agriculture focusing on the health, you know, because I was convinced so long ago that you need to have the agriculture food policy closely assigned to the health objectives of the Port of Spain Declaration. We have not really moved far in advance since then. And we keep, you know, you know, I'm glad to see what is happening on the ground with Helen's daughters. We keep talking about what that needs to happen at the policy level. But, you know, where is the shift going to take place? And I think that we can do it in each country if that's necessary, but it's important that the people who make the decisions internalize this and have the commitment to it. You know, we give, look at your budget presentations from your ministers of finance and see how much is allocated to agriculture every year versus anything else. You know, the, you know the numbers, you know the figures. That's what we need to change. Is there, you know, do we really believe that agriculture can be the driver of, of economic progress? I listened to um, Janil this morning, and I'm sure she is convinced that agriculture is really good, not only for her business and so on, but it's good for the country. Are our leaders really in that space? And that's, I mean, I, I don't want to rub anybody's shoulders or rub, rub anybody's feathers too, too, but it's really frustrating that, you know, these things we've been talking about for a long time is just that as time goes on, it's just a matter of statistics and no um, policy, no strategy, no action. I am totally convinced. And I hope that the pandemic, as I said earlier, has jolted us into the realization that we have to have more food sovereignty, meaning that we have to control more of our food supplies. Yes, we have to, um, we are net importers, but we have to be careful that we do not allow our local production to lapse. And when, one, when we import, we have to be careful of what we import without abrogating any of the World Trade Organization agreements or any such thing. 
So, it, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. These are things that require commitment. And unfortunately, we are not seeing. We are not seeing that. I know the international organizations are trying as best as they can. PAHO, FAO, um, UNICEF, and others. Um, CARDI has been lamenting the fact that, you know, our local um, priorities are not based on science. You know, you know when, you, when you go to a country and you say, okay, but we, we have to be more strategic about this and we have the brain power in the region to really do this. I'm hoping that the decision makers can come on board and make sure that we make a move because if not obesity and NCDs, if it's not already over, overwhelming and swamping our health budgets, it's going to do so even more so. Over. Okay, we have uh, Lennox Slamkin. He has had his hand raised for some time, so I'll let him go ahead and speak. Yes, um, am I in? Hello? We're hearing you, go ahead. Yes, you are. Um, let me make a few points. Um, firstly, um, Janelle, my friend Janelle, uh, made a point regarding um, regarding farmers. I do not agree that farmers. Uh, uh, I think we we gravely underestimate the knowledge of farmers because of the way we treat them. I I have just done a presentation for for ninety plus farmers in my area. I'm, su I'm surprised that the at the level of knowledge that these farmers had, but they're often um, ignored, and the the indigenous um, knowledge is often not documented or taken into account. Um, again, with respect to 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 vendors, vendors resell what they uh, what is available to be to be resold. They or they main objective is just to, to make a penny at the end of the day. What we need to do is address the issues regarding, regarding farmers' markets, and uh, in some cases, cutting out the middlemen, if that, uh, if that is, is at all uh, possible. Um, but in this whole, uh, in this whole um, initiative, uh, we should be focusing on import, import re replacement, and most of the policymakers uh, keep talking about um, agricultural exports. Uh, while at the same time the floodgates are open for stuff to come into the country, that is something we need to do. I've been suggesting for ages also that we that uh, food um, um, taste is, is something that is acquired, and people eat things that they 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 have acquired a taste for. Not necessarily that it is sweet. The, the fact that we eat so much sugar is because we eat a lot of sweet stuff and. Uh, uh, lactating mothers and young children are given sweet stuff and we, we, we become addicted to sugar. Um, so um, what, we, what I'm suggesting is that we start linking preschools to uh, small organic farms, Let, get the children to come. I do that on my farm. I encourage my local uh, preschool to come and plant seeds. And when they plant seeds and, and, and they mature, they come back and reap it and they eat the stuff they plant. They, uh, they, they own the food, and that is uh, something that I've been calling for for the longest while, and something that maybe we should should be looking at uh, at the policy level, because taste is generally um, acquired at a very young age, and the focus has to be on on the preschool children and uh, and lactating mothers. And uh, another point is that eating local. Uh, we've been hearing all these calls for, for for local food and for eating local, but. Eating local has to be a value proposition. It doesn't make any sense telling me to eat local food if the food is, the food is, is poisoned with, with, with toxins coming out of the same countries that, that have them banned or restricted. That doesn't make any sense. We're going through a process now since 2020 of uh, regular malathion fogging that's killing off our, our, our pollinators, destroying the food chain. And uh, for a long time, we are appealing to government and nothing is being done. And it is interesting to hear in the pre presentation that we eat in more, more fruits. And I'm a fruit farmer and I'm experiencing serious problems with, with pollination at this point. So I hope some of the policymakers are listening and that we shift the type of um, agricultural practices, including the fact that in St. Vincent, the government is the, one of the main importers of pesticides. The, I think that is the... Uh, there's a governance conundrum. Um, the importer of a product cannot also be the, the regulator. That has to change. That's my input. Thank you.
Alistra's hand was up for some time, but she took it down. I don't know if she still wants to ask her questions directly. But Alistra, you can speak if you want to. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Just a comment I wanted to make because we talk we talk about the role of the government and the farmers and farmers is part of the, the private sector, the people who import this food that is killing us. Um, what what efforts have been made to engage the private sector and to get them on board to support our local farmers so that they purchase more of the local food rather than import all this food that is high in all the all this ultra processed food and so on. I think the private sector has an important role. To, they are the ones who are dictating our food policy right now because they are, they are the ones who are importing all this poor quality food. And so we have to engage them and get them on board to say, you know, what you are importing is killing us and you need to get on board to import and support local production as well. So I think the, the private sector is an important player that we, we need to get engaged. Thank you. Okay, we have had some very good discussions. We want to thank our funders, the IDRC, as well as other collabor collaborators of the project the University of the West Indies, University of Technology, Jamaica, McGill University, and the University of Cambridge.